Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation on this Memorial Day weekend, where we honor those Americans who died in service and reflect on what they fought for. Those principles are nearly 250 years old and are becoming increasingly challenged by political forces these days. Politics was set aside Thursday morning, at least long enough for a group of House members, all veterans who are part of the Four Country Caucus, to join the annual cleanup of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial ahead of the holiday weekend. We asked Florida Republican Mike Waltz and New York Democrat Pat Ryan about the now annual tradition for the caucus. Once I got elected, you know, and I saw the acrimony and the, the infighting, and I said, you know, let's, let's get a group of veterans together, people who really have skin in the game. I think this is important for the American people to see, uh, to see us honoring our forefathers, to see us where Democrat, Republican, black, white, brown, none of that matters. It just matters that we're all Americans, we're all veterans, and we're honoring those that came before us. This is the most powerful thing I've done in Congress, truly. Um, very, it's very emotional, and it's, po it's, it's positive. I mean, it, there's so many divisive forces, um, and so to get together with fellow veterans, all services, all generations, and just actually do something with your hands <laughs> that improves the world, that honors our veterans, that prepares this memorial for hundreds of thousands of Americans that are gonna come here this weekend, it's, it's, really, it's an honor. Who are you thinking of this Memorial Day weekend? I, I think about actually one of my soldiers who I brought home from my first 12-month deployment and then tragically um, succumbed to the, the invisible wounds of war and took his own life, and um, Sergeant Keith Nowicki. Uh, and um, I think it's important we talk about that too, mm -hmm. because now we have more post-9-11 veterans that have taken their own lives post-service than gave their lives during service. And uh, that's something else that we're working on together. Yeah, I, I think of my uncle who was a Vietnam helicopter pilot, uh, Greg Waltz. Uh, he survived, but he's told me about the people that are on this wall. And even though he survived, uh, to this day, unfortunately, he's very bitter about how he was treated when they came home. Sergeant Matt Pacino was one of my Green Berets that we lost in Afghanistan. He volunteered to go on point every single mission. Uh, and eventually a tripwire IED uh, killed him. Uh, I think about him, I think about his family, and, and I have to say, I think Pat would agree with me, you know, survivor's guilt is a very real thing. Um, why him and not me? He was my responsibility, as were the other Green Berets that I didn't bring home, and I just tell myself, I look in the mirror every time, uh, every morning before I go into the Capitol and tell myself to be worthy. You know, be worthy of that sacrifice. And our charge, I think, as leaders, as elected leaders, is to comport ourselves in a way that's worthy of their sacrifice and in front of the American people. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that stunning statistic, what, 7,000 service members died in the war since 9-11, but it's 6,000 veterans every single year since 2001 who have succumbed to suicide. Do you think that the government and American taxpayers are doing enough to address this? We're not doing enough. We don't have the urgency. It, it needs to be a national problem. It needs to be a problem that every American recognizes as theirs because these are the, the small percentage of the American people who have put their life on the line and, and ultimately given their life. It's such a small percentage. It's about 1% right. of the American population and there's just too much of a disconnect. I actually think that's a big part of the reason why we see people coming home from service and feeling alone, even surrounded in their hometowns, feeling alone because they can't relate. And so there's so many aspects to solving it, but it, it, it can't, the government has to do a whole lot more. The whole country has to come into Memorial Day weekend and yes, you can celebrate, but please take a moment and think about the names on this wall the names on your local hometown memorial, the names on the memorial bracelets of the veterans that you see, ask them about it. Ask them to tell you those stories, and, and we should be sharing those stories. So you're working on legislation together to try to expand health care coverage for the children of veterans until age 26. Do you have any pledge from leadership to actually move this anytime soon? We've been having this fight in this country for longer than both of our time in Congress. So we've been working together with this caucus of bipartisan military veterans to apply pressure. Because if we don't apply that pressure, if we don't shine the spotlight on this problem, 
it will get sort of stuck in the dysfunction of the Congress right now. I, I do think we'll get it through. At the end of the day, it's becoming a recruiting and retention problem when uh, service members can't have their kids covered. Then that's becoming an issue for the Pentagon. We're working with them to make it a priority and working with leadership to make it a priority and get it paid for. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of military service members and their families right now in this country that don't have the same health care coverage as other Americans. That is outrageous. What do you think your past service does for your thinking? Why do you think it's important for leadership? It's essential to have people that have been on the receiving end of foreign policy at the table, especially with, with the 58,000 names behind us, to keep in mind that every one of these decisions has tremendous human consequences for the service members, for their families, and there's not enough of that right now. Why do you think the number serving is so low? It's less than 1% of the population is active duty. Yes, uh, in Congress at least we're getting uh, the number up closer to 20%. We've increased it uh, uh, for the first time in 40 years, yeah. uh, just this last, this congressional cycle. But in terms of the divide between 99% of Americans who aren't serving and the 1%, that is deeply problematic as a democracy. When you lose touch between those that are fighting our wars and their families and everyone else, that's something so essential that we have to figure out how to bring folks together uh, and, and get more folks serving. So that's, again, another thing that, that we're focused on. And a lot of the work we did yep. last night on the defense bill is recruiting. Every service has been challenged on recruiting numbers, and we've been pushing in a bunch of directions to say that is not acceptable to the Department of Defense. And, and we're starting to see the numbers come up. And, and service doesn't just have to be in the military. Um, and one of the things that we're both uh, adamant and advocates of is getting us back to national service as a country. That's not a draft, that doesn't necessarily have to be in uniform, but it could be with the national park, inner city tutoring, uh, elderly care. But how do we get young people out in an environment where they're learning leadership, discipline, followership, serving a cause bigger than themselves, uh, and with fellow Americans who may not look or come from the same backgrounds uh, as them? I think there's ways we can incentivize that. You know, people here are talking about just giving away college or just eliminating debt. Well, how about the American taxpayer get something in exchange for that in terms of service? You graduate high school, you go serve a year or two. Maybe it's FEMA, maybe it's uh, the, the Peace Corps, and then you get some type of benefit. So I think we need to rethink service as a, as a country. I was looking at a Pentagon study that said one in four active duty service members suffer from food insecurity. And then within that subset, there were over 120,000 dealing with extreme food insecurity. How is that possible in America right now? It's a disgrace. We have soldiers, I had this in my unit, when we were deployed overseas in combat, their families were home on food stamps using SNAP benefits. So one of the things we've done the last several years is raise baseline pay significantly. For the most junior. For the most yeah. junior soldiers who are the most left behind right now, raise housing, basic uh, allowance for housing, BAH, housing costs across the country are so high, so yeah. bringing up uh, housing and, and the quality of life in, in barracks. Thinking about all the elements of a family's costs, like that's why this health care uh, bill is so important because health insurance is such a driver of, of that pressure. So again, if the American people knew you had people putting their life on the line for the country, not able to put food on the table. We have to wake people up and stop focusing. I mean, some of the, with respect to our colleagues, some of the, the tenor and the tone is disgraceful. When you think about the urgency of just that problem we just talked about, we've got to come together.